the Watchful Wife and Running with Ivan. Many of you will know that um, Thursday Book Club started in a panic, really, uh, during the first days of the pandemic, which means really we've been going for four years, which is um, remarkable and um, very much thanks to, um, to all your support. If you'd like to join our community, all you need to do is go to my website, which is suzannelil.com and, uh, and sign up. Tonight, though, I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Paul Ham, whose new work is this tome, which you can see, The Soul, A History of the Human Mind. Welcome to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So where exactly Where's... are you coming to us from at the moment, Paul? I'm actually in a, in a, in a bar, an upstairs private room um, above a pub, because the Play, where I'm staying, they don't have Wi-Fi. So I've, I've found this place and the, the the publican said, there, mate, fine, you just go up there and find yourself a corner and this is where I'm recording, coming to you from. Excellent. So I'm sorry if it's not great quality, but it's the best I can do. Yes, so so Paul um, ha can't see himself because he's nicely lit up. So um, anyone um, anyone have a hassle with um, how he's looking, then you can put it in the chat line and we can get you to move to one way or the other. Paul, <laughs> um, Paul, for me, you're really an Australian historian living in Paris, but that's not always been the case. In fact, in another time, you were an entrepreneur founding a financial magazine with the interesting title, The Money, for a criminal lawyer particularly, The Money Laundering Bulletin. Would That's you like right. To explain that, Mr. Hammond. You've done your research, Suzanne. I have. Thanks. I have. <laughs> yes, I, I used to run a, a series of financial newsletters in the early '90s, mid '90s. Um, one of which, our flagship, was the Money Laundering Bulletin, which was aimed at um, uh, ostensibly at you know banks and, and and deposit takers whose job was to be responsible for the sources of illicit cash coming from criminal operations, drugs. People trafficking, and um, and basically, um, I um, we 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 found that we launched it to coincide with the European directive on uh, on, um, on 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 money laundering, and so we had most banks in Europe were subscribing to it. It was a great great success, but we found to our dismay that a lot of people in a lot of uh, dubious operators in Medellin and Colombia and other places, Pan Panama, were also subscribing to. To, to know the mind of the enemy, in other words, the regulator. So we were we were reporting. We we ran that for a while, uh, for a few years, and then sold it. And um, it helped me to launch my writing career. Actually, the <laughs> proceeds of uh, the money laundering bulletin. But we ran a series of newsletters. Um, one was called Governance, which is very probably the most boring newsletter in the world. Um, <laughs> and and the idea of that was simply to hold executives to account for, for the bonuses they were paying themselves. And how they were ripping off shareholders, or not, not ripping off, but, but not actually acting in the interests of of shareholders, or in, indeed investors and stakeholders. So that was my my career back in the nineties, and and um, you know it was it was good fun, but but I always felt this great longing to write history, because of course your 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 study has been in economics and history, um, as well as business, or not not business specifically. I did I, I did a, a business course in London, but but I did a master's in um, economic history at the London School of Economics. And so that involved analysing events in the past from an economic perspective. And I must say, it taught me just, I was always, I always felt as I was studying the causes of the Great Depression, for example, we did a statistical analysis. I thought, this isn't, there's something missing here. I mean, what is really driving history? Is it really economics or um, a struggle over scarce resources or, uh, you know, dynastic struggles or, or um, you know, colonial rivalry? No, I, I thought there's much more to history than this. And the, the, the origin, the genesis of that book that you've just held up is really my answer to what drives history. But, but it's been a long time coming, that book. I mean, this is, I think, your 14th book. And you're known, well known, as a writer on war. Um, what drew you to war as a subject? The feeling that um, that it it well, 
it's the subject is not really war. My subject in all of those histories is human is the human condition in extreme situations. Mm. So the book Hiroshima and Nagasaki is not really about war. It's about an atrocity that was committed, that was inflicted on the Japanese on Japanese civilians in two cities at the end of that war. Um, my book on Santa Can is really about the, the extreme conditions of prisoners of war in Borneo, which is the worst worst prisoner prison of war camp camp in the Pacific. Um, my book on Vietnam, for example, is not really about it's yes, of course, the Vietnam War is the is the primary subject, but it, but I interviewed everyone. I, I was trying to find out what happened to that country, what happened to the people. Mm. So I'm branded as this kind of war historian, and I have to admit, you know, I get to my events, you know, retired colonels and armchair warriors. But but my books, if you, if anyone reads them closely, will see that they're actually anti-war. They're looking at the atrocity of war, what it does to people, how it how it destroyed the lives of these Vietnam veterans and and the country itself. What happened to the people? I interviewed um, Vietnamese civilians, dozens of them, whether they be. Um, uh, you know, laundromat. They they owned laundromats, which were fronts for brothels. I interviewed women in their seventies and eighties who were, who used to work for the American services. I interviewed entertainers, and and so my book on Vietnam is a is a is almost a a spectrum of experience during that hideous war. Um, my book on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I sat down with fifty survivors of the atomic bomb in those two cities. And interviewed them at length to find out what actually happened. So I'm not a classic war historian, the kind of guy who has to find out how all the, all the you know, the tech works, how the guns work, which battalion was where at a certain point in time. That, that I need to know that stuff, but it's not primarily what interests me. What interests me is the human condition in extreme situations. And that brought home to me a constant refrain, which is what drives us to the to, to go to war, to 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 slaughter each other over and over again in history, hmm. which leads to the soul. What's interesting is um, the definition of war. So for me, a war historian is quite different to a military historian. And um, mm. it reminded me of when I was asked to um, uh, join the board of this Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival. I was a bit um, hesitant at first because I'm not really a crime writer. I'm not really a true crime reader but it occurred to me that in fact crime is almost everything crime is it, it starts from taking land um it covers just a social justice it does cover um fiction and it does give some uh confidence to people when they know what might happen mm -hmm. But it's um it's an enormous concept, crime, and I think we've narrowed it in the literary world a lot. And it sounds to me, from your reaction, that that's what's happened with war as a subject, that it's become narrowed, or for many people, like your retired colonels, it's become a narrow subject. When in fact, what you're saying is it's an enormous subject. Uh, yes, I. That's and a philosophical. Very well put. Subject. That that's sorry. That last what and a philosophical subject. Yes, it is. It, it's it's why do we go to war? It's also yes. It's it's far more than a than a crime against humanity. War is an, an atrocity. It's it should be our. It it, it 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 we need to find a way to live in peaceful coexistence. That's been my. How is it? How could we have avoided this war? Is a question that is always goading me to write these books. What is it that drove us to actually commit to force of arms? With horrendous casualties, my book on World War One, for example, I'm, I'm, that was the great tragedy of the 20th century because it spawned fascism, communism. I mean, Hitler and Stalin could not have existed without World War One to destroy Germany, to destroy, destroy Russia. Now, I'm not suggesting that czarism was something to be preserved, but there are other ways of dismantling an autocracy or an authoritarian regime than... Um, than 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 massac than massacring millions of people, which is what happened in the wake of the the Russian Revolution, but also in Germany, um, we saw the complete destruction of a nation, uh, one of the great you know the great cultures of Europe, um, wiped out by World War One, destroyed, and what replaced it was a famished, des desperate country, which was reduced to Hitler's level. People ask why were they listening to this man? 
Before the war, he was a crank. He was a soapbox performer. No one was paying any attention to him. After the war, the entire nation or large swathes of Germany were reduced to his level, which is why they listened to a man who was willing to point the bone, to stab in the back. Who was to blame for the war? Well, the communists and the Jews. And it was the beginning of the end for Germany and for, for Europe, because the the direct progeny of World War One was World War Two. They're almost connected you know, there's a direct link between them. And uh, so my work, uh, my war histories have been focused on the 20th century. What are the connections also between these in, in, these events? Um, and to try to find how the Cold War emerged from the Second World War, which led to, of course, Vietnam, the, the, the hottest front line of the Cold War. So really, I'm dedicated, I've dedicated my work prior to this whole to, to answering questions and to examining what we do to each other in these extreme situations. And I have to say, uh, it's just sad for me that, yeah, women don't tend to read those books. It's just, it's just the truth. My publisher tells me. I get men to my events. Um, I get, um, you know, the women in my life, my sisters, my friends, female friends, they go, well, you know, it's very, it's great to hear you've written this book, Paul, but I probably won't be reading it. And I'm delighted to see that at my events for the soul, there's a majority of women for the first yeah. time in my writing career. Well, well I think we, we can um, continue that trend tonight. Um, <laughs> good. good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Paul, you have got, you've got a five-year-old daughter, and um, I'm not That's sure right. if you're being um, raised in French or English or both. 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 Do you, yeah. know, that, do you know that story then, um, the old woman who swallowed a fly? There was an old yes. woman who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. And as many people will know, it, she then swallows a, a a spider to get the yeah. fly that wriggled and tickled inside her. This seems to me your soundtrack, um, Paul Ham. that from what you've said and from what I've read, um, you just keep going back until you can't stop. So it the why of a child, of a five-year-old child, just seems to have multiplied for you in that you're looking for um, not only the start of or the, the reasons behind the Vietnam War, but how that reacted to the Second World War, to the First World War, to Christendom. And now we find that you... Um... Well, let me put it this way, and you're right. There's certainly an... A, I have an, a deeply inquiring mind, but... Let me, you're, you're right to, that I am going back to origins of things. I'm going, what I've always been fascinated by is the ideas that contain me. Okay. So in other words, if I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants, be they prophets, intellectuals, great thinkers, saints, theologians, then who are these leviathans on whose shoulders I'm sitting? All right. So that goes beyond war. It goes into not only who launched the war and on, on whose beliefs. And the question you raise is, it, it is also the question behind what drives us to go to war is beliefs, belief systems. Because as I said at the opening of this discussion, it's not just about economics or politics. It's about demagogues or dictators harnessing people's beliefs to their to their agenda, to their revolution, to their political program of extermination or of or of, of conquest. Let's try and, and narrow that a bit. What, 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 sorry? Let's try and narrow that down a bit. What yeah. do you mean by beliefs? Give me a couple of um, subclasses of what you well, say beliefs are. Well, 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 well I, I mean, an obvious example of religious beliefs. So the, the opening book in, my, in the soul is the genesis of belief. And the soul is the emanation of, is, is based, it was, the religious soul, because there are many souls, the religious soul believed that if it was um, rewarded by heaven, then it would have, it's, the body that it inhabited on earth had did good. It had done well. It had been charitable. It had served God. It had prayed. It had done the right thing. And salvation, the belief in salvation, the belief in salvation, that's critical, has driven I could I could list so many events in his, human history. So the belief in Christian salvation drove the Crusades, for example. It drove the religious wars. It drove the 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 the, the Thirty Years' War. 
belief that Protestant vision of salvation versus the Catholic vision of salvation. That is, that is, can be sheeted directly home to the soul, to the hopes of an afterlife that is going to be glorious and paradisal and blessed. So that's just one example of beliefs, one example of beliefs. But that we can go on and on through history and we can look at the political utopia. That is, there's another form of belief that is promised by fascists, uh, communists, some sort of utopia that is a prophet of fascism, Nietzsche or Hitler, if you like, or all of his followers. There's a prophet of communism, Marx. They promised a utopia. I mean, it's just, it's just it's a disgusting utopia in my view, of course, and in most civilized people's view. The dictatorship of the proletariat was never going to happen, and neither was the rule of the, by the master race for a thousand years. But they were prophecies which replaced the loss of religion. Yeah, I think the idea of belief and religion is, yeah. is a great one to focus on, and it's really is, sure. say quite the the focus of your book. Obviously, you work work elsewhere, but um. I come from um, a father who was um, a theologian, so an academic, yeah. French academic and mm. also a theologian. So what's interesting for me is that the books that he wrote and the studies that he made um, were similar or, or had similar territory to the soul, but I think his was really a search for an understanding of a God who was, for him, essentially a, a Christian God. So my question for you is... Um, do you come to this book as a man of faith or did you come to it? A man of Christian faith? No, a man of faith, any faith, any spiritual belief. Yes, yes, I did. Can you can you tell us about that? <laughs> no, pressure. A, no pressure, no pressure, Paul. <laughs> no, no, uh, that's, that's a huge question. It goes to my, my own personal, um, my own personal beliefs are articulated in the chapter on Spinoza. But um, I can, to short, short, to sh you know, short circuit that. Um, if listeners don't want to go to that chapter, um, it's um, it's a belief in, uh, in in well, Spinoza's God was the God of nature, and the God of nature is therefore the God, uh, the life force, which many ancient societies across the world and still to this day believe in. If that's the correct word, it's almost as if they, the the idea of a life force is it's not something you can believe in from the outside. It's something that's part of us all. It's part of every every natural natural force in the in the universe. If if life exists beyond Earth, but on this Earth as we are, I believe in this Earth, this life. I don't believe in an afterlife. I believe in this life, and that's a radical position that Spinoza took and I and many subsequently subsequently people have taken. I don't believe in a creator God, that there's an outside God who created us. And that's just ludicrous. It's a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. Obviously we created the gods. The human mind invented the gods in in the in the Neolithic period, in the prehistoric Stone Age period. They were terrified. They looked at the sun, they looked at the rivers, they looked at the mountains and animated them, deified them, gave them godlike powers, hence the Egyptian sun god. You can see ex easily the connection, psychological connection, between a terrified people who were, whose the dawning of human consciousness needed mythology, needed stories, hankered for um, an external force that they believed had created them. But this was a creation of the human mind. And many anthropologists have shown this, and I, I draw on them in my book. Um, particularly Emil Durkheim, for example, uh, with, with his studies on our the original people who lived in Australia, the First Nation people. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's an absurdity to my mind, since you ask, the existence of an interventionist God or a creator God. But there is clearly, but the atheist position is simply all many people have said, the question implies the existence of a God in whom we can or cannot believe in. The question itself implies the existence of a God. So it's a ridiculous question. It it's, it's, it's negates itself or it answers itself. So there's no point in answering it. If you say, "Do you, um, I don't believe in God, that, inst that also makes the atheist position absurd. The question is, not. it's not a question, it's there is a life force which we... Which, which 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 we have no choice other than to accept exists. Following on from that, you've said you've said on on a number of occasions um, that 
through that this book shows that beliefs are the engines of history. Now, my question is, since we're talking about circular questions, did you set yeah. and being a lawyer when sometimes you can see judgments are uh, written to reach the conclusion you've come to? Mm -hmm. um, was this a premise that you set out to prove or was it a premise that became more and more obvious as you researched? It, it, that that's not something I set out to prove. It became obvious through writing my war histories. What is as I going back to the original discussion that we had? I mean, what is driving this war? Now I can give you countless countless examples, but let's just focus on the Thirty Years' War, which is six. Um, um, this is um, uh, sixteen. Um, uh, what were the exact years? The early 17th century, up to 1648. Yes, so 1610 to about 1648. Okay, so this was a war between Protestants and Catholics, essentially. Now, mod modern historians have tried to retrospectively describe it as an economic war or a, a war of pol political dynasties. But what was driving the people on the ground, you can see there's countless examples, was the, was the Protestant vision of salvation versus the Catholic vision of faith, faith, if you like. Now, that turned on the Eucharist and other sacraments, but essentially the Eucharist. Was God was Christ's body in the wafer or not? Now, this was not some kind of theo um, esoteric theological argument. This was fought out on the streets of Germany. You know, the, the, the Protestants would damn the Catholics as cannibals, as eat the, you know, devourers of Christ's body. This was how crude it became. It was vicious. And it was an absolutely a, 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 a appalling war. I mean, it had that conflict had the greatest casualty rate of any in history in percentage terms. 40% of German speaking lands were wiped out. You had whole towns of orphans wandering around. This was fought over beliefs. And I can go, I can talk about the Crusades. We can talk about World War One, God, King and country, God, King and country. In other words, drove, drove so many millions of young men to sign up patriotism in a country. What, but that's a myth. You know, it's 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 um, country, king, and God. This is what drove driving people. The belief in those ideals was driving most people to war. Now, of course, the leaders, you can argue, were in it for power or conquest or real estate or treasure, but they couldn't achieve those Machiavellian uh, materialistic uh, goals without harnessing the belief of the people to their to their program. And at the same occurs when, when once God had been killed off in the late 19th century, early 20th century by Marx, Darwin, Nietzsche and Freud, you know, the four horsemen of the secular apocalypse. I mean, they effectively wiped out, you know, showed that the idea of a Christian God was a was a myth. And and many people obviously just, just ignored them. And, and, and as we see today, there are, there's, Christianity survives. But, but they demonstrated in various ways. And the void that was left behind had to be filled by something. And it was seized upon by these great engines of state power whose god was the state. I, I'm referring, of course, to fascism and communism and Nazism. The god was the state. And, that, and Stalin consciously imitated the structure of the Catholic Church in, in, in order to regiment his regime and to compel people to believe in this, in him or Mao, Mao, Zedong, Mao Zedong, for example, another cult, essentially, with a godlike figurehead at the top. So the, when I say beliefs, I'm talking about beliefs. This, this in, it's almost intrinsic to human nature, the need of a godlike figurehead to believe in. And it's, it's, it's a tragedy. Um, I, ideally, I would love a society where we didn't have this need in us to, for the sacred, if you like, for the mysterious, for the idea of a world where when reason ends, faith takes over. Faith begins where reason ends. And we can't dislodge that. It's, it's, it's endemic to human nature. Thank you. Um, I've noticed the time and Paul's on a tight schedule. So there is some time for questions. We've got one that's come my way already. So what I'll ask everyone to do is to keep your um, your buttons muted and just chat, pop in the chat um, box and I'll ask Paul. In the meantime, Paul, I think you yeah. have 
book recommendations. We love book recommendations. And um, I'm just wondering if there are any books you might like to recommend to well, us. <laughs> well, I tend to read to know very um, eclectic tastes and I, I, I tend to read dead authors. Uh, not not by any, it's not consciously that you know they have to be dead, but uh, but it just seems to be what I'm drawn to. So I'm reading Middlemarch at the moment again, which I love, and I love George Eliot. I think she's one of the great great writers, beautiful writer, and and she's one of those rare writers that actually steps back and comments on her characters, and she gets away with it. I mean, very few writers can do that and comment on their psychology and what they're doing, what motivates them. And 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 so I'm just reading that again. I read it as a student. Um, there's also the Red Book by Carl Jung, which intrigues me. An extraordinary, um, almost a sort of confessional of Jung's own consciousness, trying to sort of examine his own consciousness and what drive the, the symbols and the ideals that that appeal to our subconscious. I haven't read it all, but I'm in the process of reading it. And so far, so good. It's, it's, I mean, it, it was suppressed, or he suppressed it for a long, long time and wouldn't release it. Um, so it's worth looking into the to the origins of, of that book um, to, see, to, to see how it sort of came to be. And finally, look, I shared a podium recently with uh, Masha Gessen, mm -hmm. um, the, the Russian exile who lives in America now, writes for The New Yorker. Um, and they, they use the non-binary pronoun, has written a biography of Putin, which came out some years ago, called The Man Without a Face. And it's, it's very good because they, is, they are very close to Putin and indeed uh, has met the Russian leader. So it gives you a kind of a Russian glimpse on the motivations of of the Russian leader. Thank you. I've got two questions. The first one's from um, a fellow writer, Elizabeth Walton, and um, this is um, this is what she she's asked, or at least she and a partner have asked. Have you read Richard Flanagan's Question Seven and its surrealistic approach to the devastation on Hiroshima and the link to H. G. Wells? That's one question. And um, from Elizabeth, how could the atom bomb be linked to salvation and the soul? Easy question, Paul. Go for it. No, oh, that's really straight. I haven't read Richard's book, and I'm going to read it. I have it. I have it. Um, I uh, he his source for the atomic bomb is a historian whose conclusions I disagree with. I think Richard Rhodes. Um, uh, the the idea that the bomb somehow ended the Pacific War, it's in itself is a piece of post-war propaganda and basically a lie. Uh, the Japanese, as my book in Hiroshima Nagasaki shows, and I dismantled the entire last year of the war to demonstrate this, is that they were going to fight on and on until America kowtowed to their condition, which was the life of Hirohito and the continuation of the empire, of the emperor, of the dynasty. And that the, the Americans agreed to after Nagasaki. The, the fact is that so I disagree with the source of that book, but I haven't read the book, so I can't really comment on the book. But I know my feelings about Richard Rose's book, and it's 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 simply, um, I think that's the, the there's several sources for for Richard's um, conclusions about the bomb and um, and uh, the assumption that the bomb ended the war is the problem is the problem that so many people start out with, without examining whether the bomb actually ended the war. I could talk about this all afternoon because I've spent so much time. Analyzing it, um, whether can you just repeat the second question is about um, uh, whether Hir Hiroshima? Could you just repeat the second question because it's a link to salvation. Is, um, how could the atomic bomb be linked to salvation? Yeah. Soul? yeah. Um, I assume. Well, you can you can approach that question from very many different perspectives, um, and I'm assuming are they suggesting that. Uh, there was some kind of um, mm, that's how do we put this from the American point of view that somehow it, it, it sorry that it was salvation that from that, the that it was salvation well that is how some churches cast the bomb after the war 
uh, some of the more firebrand southern churches said this is the uh, this is um, a, you know a weapon given to us by God and it is one, one of the tools in the arsenal of of the righteous is how it was described a a, a weapon in the arsenal of the righteous in other words America being the righteous and the weapon the atomic bomb we had split the at at the west had, well, the America had split the atom and uh, hence we were somehow uh, biblically endowed with the power to conquer our enemies. Um, now, you can imagine my reactions to that. I think it's absolute nonsense. This is a war crime. This is an atrocity. If everyone, anyone thinks they can derive salvation from it, they're deluding themselves um, to, in all kinds of ways. It's a ridiculous notion. This, 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 the use of the bomb um, was dropped deliberately on two cities of civilians. It was done to demonstrate the, the efficacy of, of the ato of atomic power, not to Japan. Japan was conquered. Japan was a smoldering ruin. 66 cities were already flattened. They didn't have to prove anything to the Japanese. The reason the, drum, the bomb was used to pr was to prove something to the Russians. It was the first strike in the Cold War. We have a question. We've just got two questions, and then, then, we'll, then we'll let you go, Paul. Sure. Um, to, so this is from Stephanie Darek, who you might know as a um, an author and also a theologian. Uh, mm. To what extent do you see belief driving the terrible slaughter in the Palestinian occupied territories, driven by a belief from Jewish religious extremists that they are entitled to establish the state of Judea, so the Messiah mm. will come, supported by Christian nationalists in the US? Mm -hmm. added this to the US pursuit of a Western base in the Middle East and the belief in their entitlement to that. So I think She's, the question is, do you have a view on this? I certainly do. She, she de The question demonstrates the, the theme of my book, that belief is the engine of human history. Here we have two completely opposing beliefs at each other's throats. The belief of, on Hamas society is that they want to establish an Islamic theocracy in Palestine. All right, that that's that they've 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 stated that in their in their charter. It's online; you can read it. Um, in other words, an uncompromising theocratic system, driven by their belief in in Islam. The on the other side, as the question describes, is the similarly theocratic belief in. Israel as a as the promised land, as Moses promised the, the Israelites. In other words, that they would claim all the land to the sea. And this is the tail wagging the dog in the Israeli government because the orthodox, um, the, the extreme orthodox um, uh, uh, members of the parliament are actually controlling the government. Members of the government are controlling the government. And that's what they ideally wish to see. So you have two extreme beliefs sitting back and driving this. Yes, of course, the press doesn't really report that. You'll find that, you know, the press like to think that people are, in general, I'm saying, are rational actors and there's some kind of reasonable explanation here. Or they will dismiss people of faith, extremists, like extreme zealots, like the Christian nationalists or the Christian Zionists, we should call them. They're Christian Zionists. They believe that the creation of Israel is a good thing because it is a step towards um, the mass conversion of the Jews to Christianity, which is the herald or the uh, a sign of the coming of the Messiah, of the return of Christ to earth. Now, you know, the, the, we don't read about this very much because it's it, it sounds bizarre to most secular people who read the New York Times and the Guardian. You know, so in other words, those Christian nationalists are dismissed as the far right. So they, they put it in a language we can understand far right versus far left, uh, polit a political divide. It's not about politics. It's about religion and religious beliefs. And indeed, the the wish for some kind of theocratic state, which is the view of the extremists, I should say. Of course, not the moderates. I'm not referring to them. But the people in power driving this are extremists, extreme zealots. So I, I think the question is very pertinent to the crisis we're in. And finally, Paul, a question from Gillian Hunt. Um, and hello, Paul. I'm curious about the title of your book, Soul, A History of the Human Mind. Soul to me is mystery, but you seem to be dismissing mystery. Are you equating soul and mind? Uh, it's a very good question. And the answer is that um, 
I'm certainly equating soul and mind, but not in a particular point, not not to throughout history. I'm saying that the soul, um, up until the Enlightenment, this mysterious spirit within us, our voice, if you like, our self, our sense of um, uh, the eternal I within us, the the idea of the spirit without the flesh going to the afterlife, whether it be Hades in the ancient world, the underworld in the Egypt, ancient Egyptian tradition, or heaven or hell in Christian Shude, um, Christian and Islam. Um, now, that idea of the soul, the spirit of each of us, survived. In the Enlightenment, however, Descartes was the first philosopher really to use soul and mind synonymously. The mind he equated with the soul. So it's not me saying this. It's a, a whole range of philosophers who have said it since Descartes. And the mind was therefore became the kind of um, the idea that the mind would survive the death of the body was the Cartesian, you know, the the, the, du the Cartesian duality that we had a mind and a body, and 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 it's not just Descartes. The Islamic philosophers have all also made the same point hundreds of years before Descartes. So, leading on from the Cartesian system, we see mind and body really. Um, being the, the 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 division that was used, soul sort of lost uh, lost traction amongst secularists, amongst the rationalists, but certainly persisted, as I've said, and and I've and I write with great respect about the various religions. I'm not, uh, you know, projecting my own uh, view on. I'm, I'm sort of trying to chart. The book really is about charting how beliefs have been how the soul has been interpreted through time. In through the eyes of belief systems of beliefs, so we we move on from the the Enlightenment. We find that the mind is then the product of the brain, according to neuro neuroscientists in the twentieth century. Soul goes out the window. You just have to read any neuroscientific study. They they get very angry when you mention soul. This is an irrational, weird sort of you know pre Enlightenment idea, <laughs> and and you hear um, uh, the discussion of the mind as being. They, but they're trying to find out. What created the mind? How does the brain create the mind? And no one can answer that question. Why is my mind different to yours? Why is it that we're exposed to the same external phenomena, but we draw completely different conclusions? Why is my right, your wrong, my evil, your good? No one can answer these questions. What is it that gives us subjective consciousness? And my book asks those questions at the end. I don't presume to answer those questions. I'm simply the messenger or the 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 um I'm simply trying to to show how soul and mind have been interpreted by cultures and ancient and societies through time. Paul, I've left the most difficult question to last. <laughs> um, a number between one and twelve. Could you give me that, please? Any number between one and twelve. Six. Six. Okay. Now, while I'm while I'm sorting that out, and I'll explain what I'm doing. Paul, the book is a very big book. Um, how would you suggest that people read it if they're if they're not going to embark upon the whole thing? I mean, for example, I think you have a sub stack, <laughs> and is it a book that you can dip into and mm -hmm. take as chapters? So that's my okay. Well. To put everyone's minds at ease, this is a very short book given the subject matter. Yes. Uh, in fact, it's, in fact, it's a quick read given the subject matter because it covers um, human mind from three hundred thousand years ago to artificial intelligence. Secondly. Um, Kerry O'Brien's biography of Paul Keating is 80 pages longer. So, <laughs> but no one says, oh, that's a bit of a long book about Paul Keating, but maybe it's a bigger bigger subject, <laughs> a bigger ego perhaps, I don't know, um, but it's longer. So is R R Robert Caro's biography of, Jay, um, of, of um, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So in other words, it's a very short book. Yes. Secondly, it's very easy to dip into. You can dip into it any place because yes. it's arranged chronologically and thematically. In other words, if you want to know the story of the liberation of a woman's mind and soul and how the church hierarchy from the beginning of the apostolic church has dismissed women's soul as being inferior and not to be taken seriously, well, you can read the section called Unchained, which is basically the history of liberation of a woman's mind and body. Um, from the clutches of the patriarchy, such as it was, and I use the word patriarchy going back to the actual patriarchy of the of the early church. Um, so you can dip in any way you like. You can read about Kant and and Kant's idea of the of, of the, the limits of our minds. Um, unfortunately, that's a complex chapter. You can't dumb down Kant. 
<laughs> you know, so um, there's, there's, in other words, it's, it's actually, I've tried to make it fairly effortless for the reader. These are complex ideas, but I've tried to write in a way that's accessible, that's readable, that keeps, you know, one's curiosity. And my Substack, um, who made who made our minds, is inspired by the book. So that sort of seizes on one section, and 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 I edit it down a bit, and um, it comes out each Thursday. And and we can um, subscribe to that via your website. That's right, isn't it? Via my website, or simply Substack Paul Ham, and you'll see it'll come up, and you can just subscribe for free. It's for, it's free, or you can you can pay five dollars a month. You get extra benefits. Um, Five dollars a month for this is the limit. This is the minimum Substack allows, and you get four very thoroughly researched ed essays about the mind, which I thought was a fairly good deal. <laughs> but yeah, okay. I've got um, one uh, comment and then yeah. one announcement. And um, the comment I had, Paul, was yes. um, the book is excellent, and um, thank you, and. Yes. You're absolutely right. You can dip in and out. What you can also do for people who um, like audiobooks, there's a beautiful audiobook which is read by Lewis Fitzgerald, who actually, the actor, who actually sounds a bit like you, Paul. So it, <laughs> it almost sounds like you're reading it. And, and again, that's one that even on the audio you can dip in and out of. Right. That was mm. my comment. Uh, my okay. Announcement Thanks. Mm. That, um, having chosen six as your magic number, Paul, you get nothing, but Katrina mm. Davis gets a copy of your book to be sent. <laughs> Good. So, Katrina, happy, to, could, happy to give her one. If Katrina, Congratulations. If you could, uh, I'll, 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 that's okay, it's between your, your publicist and me, so you can, yeah. you can go downstairs and okay. relax. Cool. Thanks um, very much. You know, if you could uh, send me your details via email, so which will prompt me. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Paul. Um, pleasure. It's a and, pleasure. Uh, enjoy Appreciate the rest it. of the day in Australia, and until next time. Thank you. Good yeah. night. Good Bye. Night, everybody.